Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our first panel on our first day of this extraordinary conference. We, we've titled this, anybody hear me, is this one? Yes. Uh, we've entitled this panel, Accelerating Commercialization. Um, I'm pretty biased towards this one because what you have in front of you, especially if I could speak directly to um, our university researchers, this is the story that you're trying to tell starting today. So I'll begin with my introductions. My name is Allison Best and I have the honor of working in the innovation office at the University of Mississippi, our Oxford campus. For those of you, our medical center is about two hours south in Jackson, Mississippi, and I appreciate the chance to, to lead this conversation. For our introductions today, first allow me to introduce Dr. Lean Kawas. Um, she is truly a scientist turned entrepreneur turned exit, which again, for those out there, there aren't that many and we'll talk about that, um, and now has a fund. She is um, the co-founder and managing general partner of Propel Biopartners, very important for y'all that are here today. And they're um, building a truly a biotech focused fund to support life science innovations. Uh, you may know her from the press as she co-founded Athra and became CEO in 2014. And again, she managed to exit in 2020. Um, she and I, Eileen, when I were talking earlier, this is a number that actually is incredible, but yet also a little disheartening. Um, she was the first woman in the state of Washington to exit in over 20 years. And there are less than 25 female founders in the United States right now that can say they've taken their company public. So. Congratulations and thank you for your effort in that. She asked us to include her vision is to support impactful research and next gen innovators. So make sure you know who she is today, okay? Next, we are honored to have Justin Yang um, who's with us. And he is an extraordinary expert for you today because his career not only goes from bench to innovator, but he also um, directed the, for those of you that know BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, um, their accelerator program, and then the BARDA's Venture Program, which was a $250 million program focused on global health security for the Department of Health and Services, obviously very DOD focused. Um, he has a background ranging from preclinical research to financial markets. Obviously, this government influence is a big one for our conversation today. And so that unique business of science, business, and policy is, an, is a great asset for our conversation today. Lastly, we have um, Aziz Abedafsamhan, excuse me, technology scout with Nissan Chemicals. Aziz specializes in fostering collaborations between Nissan and academic institutions and startups, uh, particularly in RNA therapeutics. He began his journey as a molecular biologist at UCLA and an entrepreneur and then transitioned into the world of technology scouting. Um, his expertise spans, though, a very diverse range of areas not for the company, from molecular biology, R&D, to business analytics, and certainly startup funding. So today he brings to this panel not just his knowledge, but a deep commitment to bridging that, those gaps between university researchers, the startups, and the company. So as you can see today, these are all the folks, like I said, that have walked the walk, and we are so thrilled to have them here. One of the goals that Bio on the Bayou has is to leave our participants with um, action items, with tactical things that you can take to your startup, to your research, to your business that will actually increase and accelerate, to pun the title of our panel today, um, how that acceleration is going to make it to market. So we're just going to dive right in. Um, and Lena, if it's OK, I'd like to start with you and talk about that transition from academia into entrepreneurship. So when you first started this incredible journey that you've on, that you were on, what challenges did you face transitioning from inventor to entrepreneur? Um, I think the biggest thing for uh, someone who wants to make that transition is to understand the difference in mindset, uh, moving from academia where there's a lot of space for innovation discoveries, which I think it's a very appropriate place to um, continuously think outside of the box. And as you move into uh, the company side, um, whether it's a small company or a larger company is moving into this linear way of thinking, you're working on um, developing products. So it moves away from pure innovation into systemic development, linear. There's a goal, there's timelines, budgets are 
much more scrutinized in uh, the biotech uh, world, especially if you have a startup where there's not a lot of funding. Infrastructure, of course, when you move from a university where you have access to significant resources, moving into your own space, and how can you think strategically around finding a spot that will allow you to continue to access some of the resources in, in the university. Talent, right? Like you need to be very intentional around who to hire at the very early stage of your startup. Um, and I, this is something I tell everyone, um, instead of just focusing on bringing people that have X industry experience, 10, 20 years, really look at the talent that you have around you on campus. And because you'll have a lot of hungry minds that are looking for growth. Um, so try to balance basically finding experts that can be in a consultancy uh, type of uh, relationship with you, but hire within you know your network. And some students are like newly graduate can really uh, amaze you. So have an open mindset around everything. I think the open mindset as well, moving from academia to biotech is very, very important um, as well. Thank you. Justin, uh, let's hit on your policy expertise for a minute. A lot of our researchers out there are familiar with the incredible evolution in the federal landscape and funding. Um, as programs like i and FUSE and all of those things that are out there now. Uh, talk a little bit about the challenges and the opportunities in that, and uh, we'll just lay it out there. I mean, should we let the scientists focus on their research, or do you encourage them to go through these customer discovery processes? Yeah, so I think um, i -Corps program, for example, is a pretty good resource that, you know, exists today. And you, I'm sure everyone in the audience knows about the i or if you don't, probably talk to one of your university kind of tech transfer folks and, and figure out, you know, I think from a, from a basic, um, uh, I'll put on my investor hat on and like, you know, one of the most, you know, common questions you'll probably be asked is, well, how how is your drug, how is your technology, how is your X, you know, going to change or revolutionize or, you know, disrupt the marketplace? And like one of the first things that the i program or, or, you know, when you come through the i program, you'll get is this market research because you're engaging with KOLs, key opinion leaders, you're engaging with um, providers, you know, the physicians, you're engaging with um, the people who are afflicted with your dis this disease that you're trying to solve. And, you know, if you were, uh, I think i is a good first step because if you have a, um, a drug, I'll just, you know, talk specifically about a therapeutic um, and you're getting, you know, close to kind of your, your past your phase two, you're going to start needing to engage with these KOLs, right? And you're going to start needing to engage with um, the people, how are you going to position this at launch? And, you know, investors will, will expect you to have that knowledge and, and have done that market research that says, what I'm bringing to market is going to be different. And this is why, right? And we've, we've you know, we've interviewed you know, X number of people and those types of things. And, and that, I mean, that's number one, like, you know, just having a, a good idea of what problem you're trying to solve without having, you know, being in this microcosm. So I think that's, that's pretty important. Thank you. So we've gone through hopefully identifying the actual problem that's in the market, not just in your lab. One of the things that our university researchers have to take on next is risk, which is one of the most challenging for a lot of for a lot of researchers. I've got some good friends and faculty in the audience. One of the things I always talk about is when you have to start paying for that plane ticket to the conference as the company, instead of the university that you're representing, if that makes you flinch, we need to talk about risk. Um, so let's talk about risk. Um, Aziz, in your work with uh, universities and startups, how do you think we should be approaching risk when, when working with these? Uh, so I think when it comes to risk, I think one of the biggest uh, issues that we usually come up with um, is kind of what Justin kind of alluded to is uh, we see as like researchers, we really are excited about our technology, We're really excited about, wow, we really think this can change the world, but <laughs> it doesn't always uh, have that exact product market fit coming from the jump. I think like the i program, like you mentioned, is um, that product that market risk is always the first thing that is kind of something that we have to address. 
um, Nissan Chemical, we're a large company. Um, we've been around for a really long time, more than 100 years. We can put the muscle behind a great idea. We can put a muscle behind something that is really going to uh, amp- needs to be amplified. But when it comes to finding out, like, can this technology, can this um, um, this innovation, can this actually help you know a group of people? Can this be, be uh, addressing a major issue? I think that's kind of a, one of the biggest risks that we deal with. A lot of the other stuff, the finances, the funding, that can all be solved. But if there's that core problem that is not addressed. It's mm-hmm. really, really hard to move forward from that. So I'm very optimistic about, you know, all these other problems, but that's the one core thing that we can't get over. So if, uh, and I think that's one of the, for the audience here, I think if we're all coming from an academic background, maybe it's not something that we're very well versed in. So if we can solve that problem, then that's the biggest risk that always comes up for us. And, you know, th- that brings up a good, because we are talking about early stage research, um, not just on this panel, but in, for the conference as a whole, but since you all three have walked the walk real quick, let's just stay on that for a second because the um, it may change, it may evolve, but the risk actually doesn't go away at any particular point. I mean, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's always risk uh, associated with um, because you know when we're dealing with research, the the you know the prefix is re and then the suffix is search, right? You're rediscovering kind of things. If you look at um, uh, and uh, you know. Um, we can stay in, in the neurospace is like the, the work that like Karuna did with uh, identifying an old drug and then bringing it, you know, bring it out, adding modern day drug development tools to de-risk kind of that, that, that idea. And now we have, you know, for the first time, maybe in 30 years, a potentially new, you know, mechanism of action, uh, schizophrenia drug that's going to be coming on a market. I mean, that, that in itself is like, if, if, you know, Eli Lilly shelved that drug because of the risk, but you know it took a, a group that had the kind of expertise in development to identify, hey, this is a new target that could potentially work, and oh by the way, we can you know combine this in a fixed dose manner to to create a a totally new drug that blocks the side effects now because 20 years later we we know more about the biology of kind of the, you know, whatever it is, um, I think I think those things are, are apparent. Um, just to riff off of Aziz a little bit, I think that um, in academia, like you always have to defend yourself because of the structure of this, like you have to know everything, right? You have to know, but the truth of the matter is no one knows everything. I know very little about nothing, right? So, so I mean, and it's like working with a strategic like a Nissan or a Lily or a, you know, um, Novo, for example, like, you know, they have the expertise in house and it's okay to be vulnerable. I think like the most, like the most humanizing thing when you talk to someone, like you're pitching your stuff is being very vulnerable with like upfront about the fact that like, look, we don't, I don't necessarily know the mechanism, but it works. Right. And it's like, you can then start developing this kind of like identifying kind of a, other people that in your network, you know, like Lean was saying, that can help you right on this journey because ultimately it's not going to be like just you yourself that's going to bring this forward. It'll be like the entire kind of ecosystem in your network. That, can I ask one question? How often do you hear, I don't know, but I can, I'll try and find the answer? Do, do you hear that a lot or is that something we need to embrace a little bit more? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, two things I wanted to say actually. I, one of the things that as you move from academia into uh, the startup world, networking is very important. I would like say, put yourself out there, talk to as many people as you can and know what you don't know because that that's more important than knowing what you know. Uh, and uh, when you don't when you start acknowledging what you don't know, then you're able to identify people that you can bring on to your journey. Um, and I think a lot of people think I'm not just talking about hiring people because that will need capital, but you can actually sign up people as, as advisors that you can basically incentivize through options and stock. So that's the other thing. And the, the more people that you bring on your journey, and it's not just name listing, it's the, the biggest turn off is to have like 10 people on your slides that they just gave you their name and they never interact with you. It's actually like finding three to five people that are committed to your mission. That's very important. And on the risk side, I think understanding the, the full, that's another thing. It's like making sure that you understand the full uh, path 
for your product development from discovery where you're at today into the market. I think a lot of people think that the market is so far away. I don't have to worry about it. I'm dealing with schizophrenia. It's such a huge market, but schizophrenia is a busy market. So how, where do you think your product is going to fit within the treatment paradigm of, uh, you know, schizophrenia or any other indication, and then break it down into stages and understand the risks at each stage and understand that, you know, acknowledge the risk and show a plan how you're trying to mitigate the risk and kill fast. In academia, you try to continue to find this like journey to find new things. But when you move into biotech, you need to find the experiments that is going to give you a clear yes or no answer. Success, when you move into the industry, is clarity in the answer. When you get like continuous gray, we don't know, we have to run, we have to invest more. This is when investors start to feel uncomfortable. But if they know that if they invest a specific amount, they're going to know yes or no very clearly, then it's a much better outcome than I'm going to know maybe and then I'm going to continue and maybe for 10 years, um, that's not very attractive for investors. And you've hit on such an important part. And again, that line, um, we, we say it a lot and you hear it a lot about know what you don't know. But that phrase starts with the word no. <laughs> you may not have the answers yet, but it is critical for you to understand those pathways, those segmentations. Um, and those where your advisors um, come in. And that's so important. So. Speaking of, let's stay on knowing what we don't know. So the, those regulatory and those economic pathways that you are going to have to navigate as you start moving through this. Aziz, how do the regulatory battles that are happening now, um, not just in the United States, but around the world, how do they affect the company's decisions to work with a university or a startup? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So Nissan Chemical is a chemical company first. We're not a pharmaceutical company. And with that, there's a kind of a privilege that we have, we don't have necessarily uh, become responsible, not responsible, but we don't take on that burden of going past phase one, phase two, phase three. So we focus on what we know how to do really well, which is actually building your APIs. Um, in terms of like assisting our you know collaborators and kind of moving towards that phase one, phase two, phase three and beyond, we can always provide that, uh, like I said, the muscle, the industrial support that you'll need along that pathway. That's one way to kind of de-risk this. That's one way to kind of make sure that your regulatory pathway is stable throughout the very first experiment all the way to the market. You don't want to go halfway through like, oh, I need to change to a new CDMO. I need to change this, change that. Right. It's nice to know that you have somebody stable you can count on from the beginning all the way to the end. So in terms of regulatory, that's one of the best ways that we found that we can provide some value to some startups in the early stages. All right. So. For those of you that are going to have a meeting this in the next 48 hours with Aziz, that that thesis of how they operate, that's what's critical for you. Um, Lean, I read an incredible interview with you um, as a founder, um, and you had a fantastic quote in here. It's, you said, we invest methodically, but we support thoughtfully. I, I loved that. So as you are partnering with potential companies um, and they are having to, and you together are having to navigate these pathways. What changes have you seen, not only in policy, but in the economic environment that's going on right now that affect those decisions for you to make those partnership decisions? So uh, just like a heads up for anyone who's launching a company in the near term, the markets are very tough. So um it's, I think, the worst for the last, I don't know, two or three decades. Um, so that's just like current, okay? Uh, and there's a lot of factors that are impacting this uh, aspect, uh, specifically around the regulations around Anti-Inflation Act, uh, FDA changes around orphan indication, uh, approval path, fast track path, that is creating a lot of uncertainty around our industry. Um, and you have to educate yourself around these because investors will ask the same question, you know, whether it applies to you or not. So you need to be prepared to answer the question around why Anti-Inflection Act is not going to have a big impact on your technology, whether it's the market, whether it's the, the small molecule orphan indication. Um, there has been a lot of scrutiny um, 
on the FDA in the last few years that is driving the FDA to become more, um, I would say, unfortunately, they're going back to being more conservative in some aspects, which also, again, is creating a lot of uncertainty with investors. Um, so just acknowledging these two things and how you're trying in a big picture to you know, address these as they come to you. And having experts, like whether it's a commercialization expert or a uh, regulatory expert, there's a lot of ex-FDAs, you know, government that left, uh, um, and they're providing a lot of support to a lot of uh, companies. For us, when we look at a company, we try to find uh, technologies that are, you know, unique, but also management teams that we feel that are able to pivot, move quickly, and, um, you know, create value. And if what they're working on right now failed, that they, we believe that they can continue to create value. And we support, we do have a network of experts across everything that I've mentioned, whether it's manufacturing, it's uh, regulatory, it's commercialization that we try to provide to and support our, our, our companies. That's great. We ha I was in a conversation with a company two weeks ago where it just went back to the fact that have the principals involved actually read the dossiers for the last two approvals in that space. Mm -hmm. um, it was a new mechanism, but just listening to what the FDA, because it's all there for you to listen to that, having um, the presence and the awareness of what those conversations are is there and free for you. Just to add on to two things that you said, like uh, number one advice uh, for a startup hustle where if you're like, I don't have money to hire a regulatory consultant or a clinical consultant, you can you can look at like the Access FDA database and look at the trial structure and design that your competitors or people who are, you aspire to be um, have done because it's very telling, right? Like what was their phase one? How did they design it? How do they structure the arms, you know, and those types of things? I mean, I think that's like a girl early, very early first pass at like being able to, you know, elucidate kind of whatever kind of outcome, you know, like that you can have, like, and how looking at previous publications on other kind of, you know, drugs, you know, what, what preclinical studies did they do? What, right. where were the assays that they use or the biomarkers that they had? I mean, I think that's a very, um, it's a tip for you all, like, cause then you don't need to go and necessarily you know, hire a regulatory consultant to or a clinical consultant to design a trial for you right now, right? right? Now. <laughs> Obviously, before you get in front of the right. FDA for a type C, which you only get one of, you know, you you may you, you you're definitely going to want to. But like, you know, from the preliminary conversations, you know, if you hear everyone from FDA talking, you know, at any conference, they'll say come to us early and often, right, in an informal way. Um, because they're, they're public servants and, and government entity, like all of their, you know, various review divisions and whoever's in charge of that division is listed. Their emails are listed That's on it. a website. You can go and reach out to them, develop a relationship, right? Because ultimately they will be reviewers potentially of your application and having a very, like, again, it's not non-binding, right? But, but it, they can always change. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's like once you have that clarity and de-risking, I think that's great. One comment to make on macroeconomic headwinds and of the market. It is very tough right now. Um, it's extremely tough. It's it's uh, don't get me wrong. Like like even like founders who have previous exits, you know, are having a hard time raising money. Right. It's very difficult. And I always say go back to it's, it's not really you necessarily. Maybe it is. But but again, like most majority of the time, it's it, it's the fundamental nature of what's going on in the marketplace. If you're having a hard time raising money. A plug here would be for the federal government. The federal government budget, you know, remains the same even in recessionary periods, right? Where if you look at the NIH budget, if you look at BARDA's budget, if you look at the DOD budget, I mean, it's generally always growing. It's generally, you know, continuously being funded, right? Regardless of what's going on, you know, on uh, outside of the United States. I mean, I think there's a very robust biomedical ecosystem that's there to fund it. And I always, you know, give this kind of plug. Uh, R01, you know, success rate is probably in the 10% range, right? Or less, super competitive. Um, if you're in cancer, I, I would say don't even try because it's so hard. It's so competitive. But if, if, you know, in, but if you look at the SBIRs, I mean, there's some institutes for SBIRs that are in the 30s, right, for a score. And I mean, we can all write a proposal, theoretically, that scores in the 30s. 
Um, and, and, you know, that's free money. It's non-dilutive money, right? It's, it's money that can help you de-risk your experiments such that then investors like Lean can come in and say, okay, now you're ready for investment. Now you're ready to, you know, for, for, for you to, to be a real company. I think those, those things are um, bunkering down, surviving uh, during this like uncertain time is very important. And, and around applying for SBIRs or STTRs, the STTRs might be a more a better fit if you're still on, on campus. Um, it's okay. Like you, you're probably going to have to apply for the same program two, three, four times, but have the mindset that every time you get a review, you're getting free advice from potentially X. Sometimes it's not like I'm not going to say every review is like, but like have the mindset that there are going to be experts on the other side Actually, on the SBIR, STTRs, review panels, there are people from pharma, there are people from drug development. So you'll get like some meaningful feedback that could help you optimize your business plan. So just keep that in mind. Uh, it's not a wasted effort, even if you don't get the 30 percentile to get funded. Um, potentially now it's going to be a little bit more competitive because everyone is moving to that space, but keep keep at it, I would say. And like, one thing is perseverance is the, um, this is how you're going to be successful is perseverance and not giving up. Even with 200 no's, there's one yes that it's going to make you. And all you need is the one. Okay, so Bio on the Bayou is all about collaboration, partnership. We have the fantastic software for you to do, and hopefully you, you're, you've got those partnerships there. We, I think it's a safe assumption. We all know that collaboration, partnership is absolutely necessary, especially in, in the biotech space. But um, we need to hear a little bit about what makes that successful, especially in the early stage. So Aziz, talk about, if you can, you know, what makes in hindsight, what makes a good partnership when you take that academic on or that startup on? And, and if you're willing to share with the group, um, you know, what priorities are you making when making those decisions? Yeah, um, I think the first and foremost, and they've alluded to it more than once, is a, a good relationship with the person, your, uh, your champion at the company, specifically with the strategic. Um, there's a lot of no's, but there's also a lot of like a not nows, or even if you're ready, we might not be ready. So there's a lot of that. Let's keep dating. Let's keep hanging out. Right. We might need to push this off another year. Right. That really doesn't necessarily mean no. So having a friendly, you know, relationship, if you're in the city with the person you need to talk to a potential strategic. And a lot of this times this turns out to be like the champion who's going to bring you all the way. They like your idea. There's somebody inside the company. I'm often that guy. So you find that person, you get to know them very well, right? You know, send Christmas cards, things like that. It's not, uh, I know some people think it's cheesy. I know some people think it's not, but um, cultural aspect of it for a Japanese company, it's very, very important that you focus on this for a long period of time. Some companies move very, very slowly. So you need to, that's just a major part of it. Like you're trying to be building a partnership. This is only one step short of a real marriage, you know? Um, the consequences of a divorce can be pretty severe too, so. I think um, the, it's a big relationship building activity. This takes a long time. So that's probably what I would harp on the most. You said a great line in there about the company may not be in the right place for the partnership. The university might, uh, or the startup may not be in the right partnership. But if uh, I'm going to ask you all to be very candid for us and, and for my colleagues out there, just give, it, give us the harsh truth. I mean, what are the things that we need to do better in order to create these synergies and partnerships with, with you? So I, I, I want to like reinforce what Aziz said is uh, since I was on the fundraising and now I'm like investing, um, it's understanding that investors see a lot of deals and um, they have a bandwidth. So a lot of the time it's not about they like your technology or not. And if they're spending time with you and they gave feedback or suggested that you talk to someone. I think it goes a long way if you connect again in a few months and you've actually put an effort to think about what, you don't have to follow it, but put an effort to think about what they said and acknowledging that, you know, we've, we've did, we did talk with this group or this person, we did that and it worked or it didn't work. It just shows that 
you uh, you would be a good partner, right? Because any partnership, it's two ways. Um, so really ac- acknowledging that. But um, I have to say, like, I'm, I'm, it was a shock for me how much you get on the other side. So now I empathize, actually, with investors that <laughs> when they say n- n- no, it's probably not now because of bandwidth. Most of the time, I would say, 10% of the deals we say no because it's a bad deal, but most of it is just like, we don't have the bandwidth. It's We're working into a, two or three other deals. Justin? Yeah, just to, just to add on to this, like I always say this point because if you go to bio, if you go to these like partnering events, even here bio on the Bay, you, it's like it, it the, the deal, the relationship goes beyond the deal, right? And at the end of the day, the business that we always have is so transactional. And I really hate that about the industry because at the end of the day, like you're not, uh, you know, like it's all oftentimes you say, you see 200 no's, but you build this relationship with your counterparty at, you know, Beckton Dickinson at, you know, wherever, like just any, any, or, or a VC or wherever. And it's, it's like, you know, if they tell you no, it's kind of like, okay, great. Thank you for your feedback. You know, just that one email after that no is like so important because at the end of the day, you know, it's like if, if, if a VC takes time to write to you, like, here's the, here's where we see kind of, you know, your, your, you know, whatever's going on. Um, and they get, they take the time to give you that feedback. I mean, honestly, it, it, you, you as the recipient should, you know, take that and you should, you know, be thankful for that because, and then, and then maybe in six months, you know, you've taken that advice and you've done the study that they've recommended you do and you come back to it. And it's just, it's just goes beyond the transaction. Like oftentimes, Hey, do you want to invest my company? No, thanks. Bye. You know, and it's like, it's gone. Like, that's it. Like you're not building any, any kind of relationship. And it's so important in this business that like, you're building these relationships because I can just tell you, um, investors in the fund or people that I've done business with in the past. Right. And, and, you know, and it's like, whether or not they said no to me then, you know, versus now it's, it's completely different. It's, it's like, you, you're a good human being. You, you, you know, you, you, you build this relationship. Fantastic. And we're going to open it up to questions from the audience, but just before I wanted to make sure is these mm-hmm. anything specific in terms of working with Nissan in that space? In terms of how to connect with you, oh, what's the best way? If you want to connect with me, just tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, <laughs> right up to the stage right now. You can do both of that. Um, no, honestly, uh, my email is going to be available for everybody. I'm very happy to take it. Um, I give people my personal phone number. Maybe I shouldn't, but, you know, people text me and there's um, just kind of like, again, about the relationship thing. I have one guy. He has my number. He messages me every weekend. Like we are always talking. You know, he shares a name with my brother. So we we made a connection. There's a really good chance we're not going to work with him on this deal, but he's still persistent. If he decides to do something else, You've I'm going to reach out to him. I'm just like, what are you doing? Tell me what it is. Maybe we can do on this. So, and but yeah, fantastic. just come. The Don't be shy, please. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. So it's your turn to ask some great questions. Any questions from the audience? Come on. Yes. Hi, good morning. Chris Galil from the New Orleans Automation Center. Hey, Justin, you mentioned... You mentioned uh, following up with investors. Excuse me, Justin. You mentioned following up investors on the private side and keeping that relationship going. Uh, could you tell us is there a difference between dealing with funders on the private side versus the federal side? And what do you do after an opportunity where you might have been turned down for a, a federal opportunity, whether it's through an investment vehicle or some other type of grant function? Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's it's it goes back to the relationship. I'll put on my Barta hat on. I, I can just tell you for a fact that, um, you know, very rarely will an agency fund you. You know, I, I'm not talking about the NIH peer review process, but if you're talking, if you're going to Barta, if you're going to DoD, if you're going to whatever, we just had a company that got a 300 million dollar contract from Barta, right? So I mean, the scope and mag- magnitude of funding is there. Um, I can just tell you that, like, you know, if very rarely have we ever, when I was at BARDA, funded anyone that we just came cold, right, with an application mm-hmm. that, like, just threw an application over the wall, through the broad agency announcement or whatever the announcement is. Like, it just doesn't happen. Um, and it's the same on the other side. It's like you, again, like, it's a relationship because if I'm going to give you money to, do your research. If I'm going to invest in your company to do your research, I'm going to make sure that like, I trust you as an individual, right? That you will 
be coachable. You will listen. You will understand because it's a partnership that's ultimately going to happen. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the same, honestly. It's like, you know, get after, if you want to go after federal funding, like go after the people that are, you know, your counterpart on the other side and build that relationship because ultimately they're going to do, you know, yes, they're going to review it in a way that is like not like commercialization focused, but they're also, they're, they're going to, you know, scrutinize all things, right? Because it just goes beyond, here you go, here's the money, come back to me in six months. It doesn't happen like that, you know, like in, in, in those, in, in, in yeah. Specific, uh, on the website, if you go to the specific ROI, there would be like a specific person listed as the contact. And if you email them and ask them, like inform them that I'm going to be submitting an application, this is the basically the content of the idea, they will respond back to you and they actually will give you some guidance on how to structure it. The other thing is they do a really good job with putting together um conferences or seminars to for you to go and actually meet these people in person. And they're typically also present in the conferences that you, the scientific conferences that you attend. Um, and, you know, try to make that content, a contact and uh, work with them. I remember one time I was talking with a guy, a director from the NIH, and he was telling me about his horses and his farm. And it's like, so it's like, it's all relations as well, but there are ways that you can be intentional on how to reach out to them. Hi, thank you. The panel is stellar and the feedback that you've been giving is amazing. Pooja Majmudar, uh, I'm with Silicon Valley Bank, work with early stage companies in healthcare life sciences. Uh, the question I had was for the panel, specifically for Justin, um, you know, speaking about non-dilutive funding coming through SPIRs, STTRs, when I work with early stage founders, they're gun shy in applying for these funds because of, you know, the arduous process and they just want to approach high net worth individuals, you know, to just kick started on the fundraising journey. What, again, I'm not looking for specifics, what percentage of companies uh, do you fund that have the seal of approval from, you know, NIH, SPIR or NSF um, funding? And again, this is critical because you establish a relationship not for early stage, right. but as you grow and scale the company, uh, there are still non-dilutive fundings through um, NIH. So not, not saying that that's a bad option, how do you, you know, convince early stage founders that this is, this is an option? And B, um, how do you perceive that uh, when you're making investment decisions? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm biased because I like all of my companies, all the companies that I've built, all the companies that we like we fund has to have this dual use strategy because that's just what I know. So my answer to you will be biased because ultimately my goal in this is to address unmet needs and, and you know, save lives and all of these things of working infectious disease. So, I mean, at the, at the end of the day, um, if you look at GHIC's portfolio, half of our portfolio have either a barter relationship or an NIH relationship. I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, and, and, but, you know, at the end of the day, our biggest uh, investor in our fund is, you know, the U.S. government, right? So, um, so kind of it's it, maybe maybe Lian and Aziz can can speak a little bit more about that. But for me, it's like I highly encourage it. It's just because it's like okay, the application is a pain in the butt. But at the end of the day, if someone could tell you like you're gonna get free money, like up to one point two million dollars on a phase two, a six hundred thousand or you know five hundred thousand on a phase one, like and you have to you know write a few applications, like that's like um, like amazing, right? Like who who has that? I mean that's, that's yeah. All right, Lane, I think we've got time for one, one more. Thank you guys for your information. This is great. So I'm Chip Paul with Indo Analysis. And can you guys kind of give a indication of what's the best way to approach you all? Is it, you know, come with a deck? Is it come with a conversation? You know, what, what do you guys, uh, how do you guys like to see things teed up when you're working with somebody new or being introduced to somebody new? Yeah, I think um, doing your homework is so important because you know ultimately if you're gonna if you're gonna approach a you know crossover fund or I'm just ma I'm making this up if you're gonna approach a, a crossover fund and you're a seed stage company you're wasting your time right it just shows that you're you're first of all you're probably never gonna get a response um, you know it's it's like doing your homework 
uh, on whoever you're meeting, the company you're meeting, building that relationship is super important because it just shows like it's evident. Um, like the night before, like my my preference is always sending a deck to whoever you're going to meet the night before, right? Just say, looking forward to meeting with you. One, it reminds them, right, to show up to the meeting, right, it, it, indirectly. Two, two, it's like, hey, you know, I, I'm very responsive, you know, like, you know, those kinds of things. I mean, I think that's so important, the momentum that you build, because as Lee alluded to, there could be two or three deals at any given time that you're looking at. And if, if you may be hot right now, but in a week, you won't, you know, you, you, that could, you could lose it. And, and the responsiveness, I think that if uh, after the initial contact, if there were like some questions and you're taking your sweet time to respond, it just shows that this is not an urgent thing and it could like slips because within 10 minutes, there's going to be a new deal that is going to come in front of uh, um, investors, basically. And and uh, around the NIH funding, and there's a few groups that support uh, like free mind group and several other consultancy groups that support you with uh, NIH uh, applications. It could be a little bit intimidating at the beginning because it's a big, you know, moving from a university that helps you with all of the administrative stuff. Now that's all on you. And they actually, the fee structure is that you pay them if there's, if the applications are successful. And one thing actually, one, one group free mind, which they, they do, thousands of applications there was a correlation between success they did like over 10 years correlation between success of companies and their nih score for svirs sttrs so that's a very interesting data point that's a uh, great data point especially to end on with this conversation um aziz lean justin thank you so much for sharing not just your time and your candor on this panel today but but your time with this group um by being here at bio on the bayou we thank you so much thank you very much